interest in climate change. So it was a huge jamboree. Um, the, the meeting took place in, I'll, I'll set the scene a little bit, it took place in what looks like a huge uh, golf course. It's this great big um, green verdant rolling uh, area in Bali where there are many, many five-star hotels. So it's sort of dotted with these little oases with pools and umbrellas and people sipping drinks and um, relaxing. Um, and then, and the beach. Um, but then sort of in among that is nestled this, uh, the, the conference centre. And so many of the people who, who were there were not sitting around the, the pools, but they were dressed in their suit rushing to and from these meetings. And it was about 40 degrees, and so everyone is incredibly hot. Centigrade, yeah. And they'd also turned down the air conditioning in the conference centre to save greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> and so even, in, even inside the conference centre, it was actually quite hot. Um, the meeting itself was, is really a very important meeting. Um, I think it'll be judged as important um, regardless of whether the process is successful or a failure going forward. It's important because the issue is so important. And so we know that the, the current climate regime, the Kyoto Protocol, only deals with 5% of greenhouse gas emissions from only a small part of the world, like from the Annex 1 developed countries. We need to do much better than that if we're going to address the problem. So that's what the, the purpose of this process that was set up in Bali is to, to begin to do that, to negotiate over two years running through to 2009 to the Copenhagen meeting of the Conference of Parties where the goal is to come up with a new climate agreement that's capable of addressing the problem. And that's really a very tall order. Um, what was I doing there? Well, a mix of different things. Um, a lot of my work was focusing on the negotiations themselves, trying to support some of the negotiators in the process. Uh, I was also involved in, in organizing a side event, um, which, by the way, take place at another hotel. So people either get bicycles or they walk through the heat to these other events, you know, often far away from the, the convention process. Talking about free bicycles. There are free bicycles. Um, and then a lot of it is networking as well, getting together with like-minded people, planning your your future work and so forth. And so maybe concretely, what, what was I doing? Um, uh, part of what I was doing was working with, with a group of developing countries. And to, to give you an example, part of it was working with a colleague of ours in Argentina. In, she was heading up their delegation. She's a former student of Durwood's and a, and a, a close friend um, of ours. And um, part of it involved giving legal advice. And so if you imagine these delegations, they're often quite small from the developing countries. They're facing up against delegations from the EU and the United States and some of the other larger players of dozens of people. And you know, enough people to really cover all of the different aspects of the negotiations, get back together, discuss strategy, go back out, continue moving the, the ball forward in a, a variety of different fora. The developing countries often have smaller delegations. And so it's a real challenge for them to follow the negotiations, to have time to do the legal research and um, analysis to really try and understand what's happening in the different forums. So part of it was staffing them. Um, I also drafted a, a negotiation, negotiation um, proposal for them on programmatic CDM. Basically, the, we talked a little bit in our class about the clean development mechanism. One of the problems is it's only focused on projects, project by project. And so there are attempts to broaden that out so that governments can also come to this mechanism to get funding for programs that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we, we drafted that and that was um, something they, they used. And then a lot of it is just pulling together speaking points and notes <coughs> and helping them get done what needs to be done. So practically, you know, every morning I would come to the conference center, I'd get the documents. The first thing you need to do is to get the agenda, work out what's happening um, in the various negotiations and contact groups and then work out where you need to be. And then I would spend my time sitting, drinking coffee on a chair or a couch outside one of the, the contact groups, waiting for the negotiators to come out, see what they needed, provide them with my analysis and so forth, and, and support them in that process. And then we organized a meeting, also a side event, um, on uh, links between climate change and development. And so one of the big challenges now is that we really need to bring these two different of areas of policy making together. Many developing countries are really 
going to be very hard hit by, um, by climate change. Many of them are big emitters, so they need to be thinking about how to reduce their emissions. Um, yet many development policymakers haven't thought much about climate change. So the goal of the event was to try and explore some of those linkages. Um, in terms of the formal process in the meetings, you have the big plenary meeting where everyone gets to sit and the NGOs can also go in. But then pretty quickly, as we saw in our negotiation um, simulation the other day, things get messy. And if you can imagine you know, the document full of brackets in all of the various sections of the, the negotiation text, you, know, you end up with each one of those in, um, in a contact group somewhere in a room around this hotel being discussed by a subset of the delegates. So you have a game of chess being played on multiple chess boards simultaneously. And so part of, the, part of the goal is to try and work out which moves being made over here on technology transfer, how it affects technology transfer over there, how that will play out in relation to some of the other linked issues over here. So part of it is, is, is sort of working on that strategic level. Um, you know, there are a range of issues with the, with the process. Um, at one point, a number of developing country delegates weren't being allowed in the room. There was a big group of, of um, ambassadors and senior negotiators who were being excluded. And the, the secretariat had two lists. One list was of who could come in and who couldn't. And the other list was of who could have more than one delegate and not. And so you had some delegations inside the room with three or four people. You had some delegations in there with only one person. And you had some delegations who were excluded. And so you know, part of what we did was create a fuss about that process. And my, one of my colleagues actually got, ended up getting excluded from the, that part of the conference center for a while and inciting some of the developing country um, diplomats who are all very diplomatic. They're not used to creating a ruckus, but sort of encouraging, encouraging them to really stand up and, and fight to get in the room so they could defend the interests of their, their citizens. Um, the outcome of the meeting was um, this Bali roadmap or the Bali action plan. And that sets out four very important pieces of the process. Action on mitigation, access on adaptation to climate change, and then two means of achieving that. One is technology transfer, you know, the, the need to really get low carbon technologies onto the ground, both to do the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and, and the adaptation, and then the investment and finance that you need to do all of that. So these things are now set up in this Bali roadmap that will guide the process of negotiations over the next two years. And then as well as that, there are a number of other outcomes. There was agreement of an adaptation fund so that they can, countries can start already thinking about their adaptation effort. There was a decision on technology transfer. It was very important. They moved technology into, out of the uh, one body dealing with scientific and technical advice into a body dealing with implementation. And that's also very important because it's actually, the focus is there on actually how do we get these obligations onto the ground. Um, and then there was also some, some important decisions on, on uh, forestry related issues. So there was a lot happening a lot going on at once, and I only saw one little slither of it, so I'm very curious to see what my colleagues saw. Okay, will I get wired up here? Cool, why not? Great. Uh, I actually saw Matthew a few times, so uh, I know a little bit about what he did. It's great. I uh, went as an NGO advising a group of governments and I brought four other, are, can you see me back there? You're shaking your head. No? Better? Well, I want my good side, so let's, let's get, this, uh, get this right. Okay. So I brought four other uh, staff folks as well and funded two uh, people from government, one from Mauritius, the uh, deputy minister, one from uh, Mauritania, uh, the uh, the minister, and had them stay in the same hotel. Ours was 30 minutes away from the main conference center, not a five-star hotel, although very nice, so that we could work with them to help them during the evening, during the morning breakfast, and so on. One of the people I brought uh, was uh, K. Madhava Sarma from the Montreal Protocol Secretariat, which he headed for a dozen years. One of the most talented people on ozone and climate I I've ever met from India and has great uh, contacts and insights into what's going on still in India. 
Our goal was to take the success of the Montreal Protocol effort, which we'd succeeded uh, just a couple of months before in September, with a campaign to change it into an explicit climate treaty as well as an ozone treaty. And we did this by accelerating the phase out of one of the chemicals, HCFCs, in a way that supports climate benefits and energy efficiency. And the overall climate benefits are calculated to be 15 to 25 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. That compares quite favorably to the 5 billion tons that we're seeking from Kyoto in its five-year initial uh, commitment period. It's a big bite out of the climate problem. We, uh, we started the, the campaign in Montreal, uh, and, and what I'm saying is we're bringing this success into Bali. And we start with the notion that um, abrupt climate change is, the, is a legitimate piece of how to define dangerous level of anthropogenic emissions. And there's a tipping point that may be as close as uh, 10 years away, according to Dr. James Hansen, for the melting of um, the uh, Arctic ice, then the Greenland ice, and the West Antarctic ice with uh, six to seven meters of sea level rise. The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences published uh, another paper 5 February, just uh, a week ago, listing a whole uh, additional series of tipping points. And one, uh, the, uh, the monsoon, the disruption of the monsoon from Asia is a year away, perhaps. Others ranging uh, 50 to a couple of hundred years. So once we cross these tipping points, we're, we're, uh, we're not going back. So we said um, we can get fast climate mitigation under Montreal, and uh, we can then extend this through um, uh, the same techniques in Bali. We did a series of side events. Um, the first one was organized for governments, for the governments who were successful with Montreal. That included um, Sweden. Uh, it included um, the United States, Argentina, uh, the Netherlands, Mauritius, Mauritania. We helped all these people get ready with their presentations. We helped them figure out what the key lessons were from this success. And then we, we put on the, the side event. We did a second one um, on compliance, which is a critical issue because the North and the South, and even within each of these groupings, uh, countries have different conceptions of what is appropriate for compliance. Do we need a WTO uh, enforcement mechanism uh, that's more legalistic uh, and adjudicatory, or do, do we need something more like Montreal, which is compliance assistance? We did uh, a third event, which was a, uh, a, an intimate dinner for about seven uh, ministers or vice ministers including Argentina, the U.S., Japan, Canada, uh, Mauritius, Mauritania, and uh, Micronesia. These were parties who were successful in the Montreal Protocol. Uh, the U.S. Was, uh, was represented by Jim Connaughton, who chairs the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and has been somebody who's been remarkably good on Montreal. So we're trying to teach him a little more on the climate side. And we had a dinner so that we could spend several hours talking about this. Uh, we did one more with, um, with the Third World Network with Matthew on the, s the same lessons of the, the Montreal Protocol. Um, we, we then um, were trying to say that the, the lessons include the following. First, um, the focus on abrupt climate change and the need for fast action, like Montreal. Second step of Montreal is to go after the banks of CFCs and HCFCs and old products and equipment. We got at the side event that was hosted by uh, governments, the U.S. and Argentina, to make a pledge that they would submit a proposal for changing the Montreal Protocol to go after the banks of CFCs and HCFCs and old products and equipment this year. That was a big commitment which we got them to make publicly. So far, they're following through with this. Uh, second message was um, other things that could be done for fast climate mitigation. Energy efficiency is the fastest, cheapest mitigation. 
and it has a lot of political support because it has strong co-benefits for development, very quick payback period, good for everyone in the world, but not happening in many cases without some outside primer. Second, uh, black carbon or soot, which James Hansen says may be the second most important uh, contributor to climate change, both because it, cha it has a, it's an aerosol, it traps heat, and because it uh, changes the albedo of snow and ice when it's washed out. And that's leading to the further acceleration of the, the melting of the Arctic ice and, and Greenland. Third lesson is that we need to disaggregate the climate problem by breaking it into smaller, manageable pieces. The Montreal Protocol is, a, is an example of that. We took out this set of chemicals and we designed a specific governance system that was tailored to the industry, to the technology, and to the, the developing countries and the U.S. Um, so we could get the common but differentiated responsibility right. So we're saying, the, you're going to have to watch me on the time. We're, we're saying the same thing with climate. You need now to further disaggregate by source, sink, and sector. Cement. You know, there are only eight countries of the world that you need for a deal on cement. There's only so much technology that you need to do a deal with cement. So you can tailor a governance system, you can address competitiveness, you can address technology, you can figure out what it costs, which is very important, and you can tailor the common but differentiated responsibilities between the North and the South. The same with steel, the same with aluminum. So this is a very important shift, and, um, and we, we were getting some, uh, some very good response to this. Uh, we, I want to contrast this. Um, to the large emitters uh, uh, process as well, the large economies uh, process, where the U.S. has brought together the uh, 16 largest countries responsible for emitting 80 percent of climate emissions. The, Mont the, um, the Bali process, the whole U.N. Uh, uh, climate negotiations, is described by uh, Ambassador Richard Benedict, who negotiated the Montreal Protocol, as a medieval fair. So you've got 11,000 people in Bali, all right? several thousand official delegates, several thousand NGOs, several thousand press. It's, it's a zoo, really. I mean, it's everything. There were 30 different contact groups, small negotiating groups. Uh, Matthew mentioned that some countries send one person. They're lost. They don't know what to do. When they don't know what to do, they drag their feet because they don't want to look stupid. Okay? So we, uh, or they stick with rhetoric because nobody knows the technology. Nobody knows the cost. Nobody knows the real solutions for the whole problem. So it's a, it makes it a very cumbersome process. And if I were betting that uh, this process was going to save the world alone, I, would be, I wouldn't sleep at all because I think this would, be, this would be really tough. So the U.S., and everybody hates the U.S. On, for so many reasons, including climate. Uh, but I don't hate them, okay? Because I, they did what I asked them to do on the Montreal Protocol, right? And they've taken some further advice on, on climate. And, and they have, I've found three people in the U.S. government who are good on climate. That's it. But that's all it takes to get started. The, um, uh, so where, where was I on this? Uh, oh, okay, so I want to compare the two. Okay, so I was in Hawaii uh, last week, um, the, the week, week before last, for the second of the large emitters um, meetings. And I went to the first one as well. And I was a fly on the wall. I mean, I wasn't supposed to be there. I got to watch uh, the governments negotiate, the 17, plus the Evo de Boer there for first half of the, the first day, and uh, a representative from the European uh, Commission and somebody from the UN. And they were saying things that were really encouraging as they wrestled with really specific pieces of the problem. Um, they agreed almost, not quite, but they're very close to agreeing to take a sectoral approach where they break down the problem. That's a great victory in my opinion. And it can be uh, actually accomplished when there are only 17 countries 
sitting around the table. The first meeting was, um, was, a, was a very harsh meeting because all the countries just blasted the U.S. And then that was a whole day. The second day they begged the U.S. to join because they needed the U.S. money and the U.S. technology. Um, the second meeting was, was really way beyond rhetoric uh, with the one exception of technology transfer and intellectual property. People were still in the north-south divide, Brazil uh, and um, uh, Indonesia and India and China all say, we want you to donate intellectual property to us. And if you won't do that, we at least want compulsory licensing so we get um, cheap IPR, cheap technology. And the U.S. and Europe are saying, you know, that doesn't fly. You know, we won't do it. And, uh, and we heard many references from the, the governments to the Montreal Protocol as an example to look to as they were trying to argue through this. Because the Montreal Protocol addressed IPR through the multilateral fund, through their funding mechanism. And we got just a, a step beyond the, um, the rhetoric. So you know, one process, I think, is, is critical. The, the small group, it's got to feed back in. It's got to be legitimate. But the, the Bali process did, uh, one of the Canadian people described it as, uh, basically, uh, you get a bunt to get on first base in the bottom half of the ninth inning, and you're down by about 20 to zero. Okay, so we're we yeah, stayed in, yeah, two, two out. Uh, we stayed in the game, barely with this, and we need to, uh, all of us and all of you need to figure out how to move this along. Evo De Boer said something very interesting as well in in uh, Honolulu. He said, we really only have 14 months to negotiate this. Okay, the first meeting, the official meeting, is going to be in April. You have to have the draft done six months before the Conference of the Parties, which will be December 2009. Right? So who's going to be in charge during this period in the United States? Well, it's going to be the Bush team through January 22nd. And then it's going to be Hillary or Obama or McCain. So what can the U.S. Uh, candidates do to lock in the negotiations now, tie the hands of the Bush team? What can Congress do? And one thing that I've been thinking about recently, Matthew, is we need something like the Fast Track or Trade Promotion Authority where Congress tells the negotiators what the parameters are. We can't, we can't give them the details, but you can give them the parameters as we have done in the trade context. We've said you have to have goals for environment, goals for labor. So we need to do this signaling now because the U.S. Uh, international negotiations always key off of the domestic process. So we have to show that the domestic process is going like this. Does anybody know what Obama's climate uh, goals are? Okay, 80% reduction by 2050. That's the European, 60 to 80 is the European. Uh, what's Hillary's? Oh, come on. Same thing, 80%. What's McCain's? 68%, okay, for, for about 78% of the industry. So he's, he's close, too. What's their 2020 goal? Their 2020 goal is to return to 1990 baseline. Okay? And the Europeans want 20%. And they'll go 30% if the rest of the world joins in. So we're, we're not too far away from getting the candidates <laughs> to signal. And that, that could be a very useful thing. So. Uh, you know, Bali was fun, it's exciting, uh, but if you don't go with a mission, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's umbrella drinks, you know, and, uh, yeah, even if you do go with that, yeah, that was our, our staff headquarters, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, here you go. Let me add a few things, try to be as brief as I can be, so we can get into some discussion here. Uh, first, just very quickly, <coughs> what I was doing there, somewhat different from Matthew and Durwood. Uh, I was there as head of a group of people from the International Human Dimensions Program on Global Environmental Change. We are one of the um, major international long-term global change research programs. Uh, as it happens, 
the Human Dimensions Program is co-sponsored by several organizations. One of them is the UN University, so I wore a blue tag with the UN on it as opposed to an NGO tag. I don't know whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. Um, we were trying to do a number of things. We were trying to present to people who might be interested and listen some of the findings of our research, which we felt would be potentially policy relevant. We did this through several side events. Uh, one project that's recently completed, we did a summary for policymakers, which we handed out and sort of talked to them about and so on. Another thing we were trying to do uh, was to interact quite a bit with people um, associated with the IPCC, uh, which was a very strong presence um, in Bali. I think we talked before about the Valencia meeting that occurred very shortly before that. Uh, this overall summary of the fourth assessment report was already, it was still labeled uh, not proofread, not final draft, but here you are, folks. But we were, in my uh, role, thinking not about the fourth assessment report, but thinking about the fifth assessment report or whatever uh, it may be. And so we're in discussions with the IPCC about things that they could do in the next cycle to um, strengthen and improve the product, particularly uh, on working groups two and three, which deal with, with adaptation and, and mitigation. Um, I was also um, interacting more directly one-on-one -on -one or with small groups of um, uh, people, delegates especially, getting their ideas about what they think it would be useful to have more research emphasis on since we see uh, the relationship be between the research community and the policy community increasingly as a two-way street. It's not just delivering our messages, but it's listening to them and saying, can we engage in a sort of collaborative conversation about how we structure our research and how we, how we present it? Um, and then finally, since many of us associated with the IHDP projects were there for uh, these other reasons. We took the opportunity to do some science planning. Uh, we didn't have to fund a lot of additional uh, airplane tickets. So one of the things that happens in these events, all of them, is that once you have a core event, lots of things get scheduled on the margin, on the shoulders, back to back, because people say, well, half of us are going to be there anyway. Let's, let's hold this meeting. It can <laughs> just, a, just a few words about the, uh, the process. Um, first of all, the meeting is kind of divided into two components. There what's known for the first 10 days or so as the working level meetings, and then there's something at the end, which is the, the high level segment. <coughs> That's when the ministers and the heads of state and so on, the, the uh, Secretary General of the UN uh, drop out of the sky and um, have some nice words to say and hopefully remove a few brackets that are remaining uh, in the text, in this case, the text of the Bali uh, Roadmap. Another comment um, to make about process um, is that there's a kind of informal but very well-known uh, distinction among several kinds of things that go on. There are the formal meetings, there are the informal meetings, and then there are the informal informals. Um, and everybody understands that a lot of the work gets done at the informal informals, but unless you're on the right lists, uh, you may not know when and where the informal informals are meeting. It's just because you're in on the informal meetings don't get the idea that you're on the, in the inner circle. Uh, another thing that was striking to me, and I'm still trying to sort out the extent to which this was um, rhetoric or not, is the extraordinary um, credence or credibility given to the most recent IPCC report. And everybody took that as a point of departure now. And Derwood will say, um, the IPCC report was didn't go far enough, of course, because it really didn't address the abrupt change, but still it was a striking, a striking sort of thing. 
Um, every day you go in and there's a line up at the information booth and there's an agenda for the day with many pages of sort of all kinds of things going on and so forth and so on. Um, closed circuit TV is giving you up updates on what's happening in various places. Uh, and then there's something that at least many of us kind of come to know and love called the, the Earth Negotiations Bulletin. Uh, this is put out uh, by a group of people who are basically supported by a Canadian organization known as IISB. Um, and it comes out every day. So every morning you get the day's END, and it tells you what happened yesterday. Um, increasingly, it has a section at the end of the daily uh, section called In the Corridors, which is the part, of course, we turn to first. And then the, the negotiators run to these stands and pick them up to yeah. find out what they missed yesterday. Right. And everybody, everybody gets this. It's yeah. not just for observers. I mean, negotiators, what happened? Um, so then there's a, a number of, uh, well, and then, and then another thing on process. Um, uh, I don't know how Matthew and Thurwood would uh, react to this, but uh, my general feeling was that the overwhelming kind of atmosphere in terms of process was business as usual. This was not Seattle, folks. Uh, there was this fairly stately process. There were a lot of people there. They were very well behaved. There were no demonstrations. There were no efforts to break into meeting rooms. Um, people were not hassled or jostled and so on. There was a sense, well, you know, another meeting, and we're going about our business. Uh, I would call it uh, business as usual. There were a number of different kinds of activities that took place. Uh, there were, of course, the plenary sessions, mostly unbelievably boring. Uh, a succession of people get up and say, whatever. It's almost, almost, there's almost never any pretty revelation. Much, pretty much whatever. I mean, when was the last time there was anything revealed in a plenary session statement? Uh, so they drag on and on. Then there are the, the, the contact groups that Matthew was very involved in, and there were to some extent too, and they are uh, obviously very important. Um, and then, let's see, uh, in, the, in the conference center at the Westin, um, imagine, you know, a kind of an of a international beach resort, a, a, a strip of international hotels. Uh, the Westin, the Hyatt, the Hilton, the Ramada, and so forth and so on. Strung along a beautiful beach, but it's very much an international tourist town. There's a lot of concern about security in Bali since the bombings of a couple of years ago. So it's a gated area. Uh, most people stay pretty much within the gated, the gated area. Um, but the hotels, are, the hotels are very close together. But, but you know, to be honest, uh, at 40 degrees C, even a hotel that's um, um, a 10 to 15 minute walk away is you know, dripping, just totally dripping. So, it, it, so what happens at the, at the conference center is the plenaries take place there. Most of the contact group sessions, although some of the informal informals go on elsewhere. And then there's this enormous set of booths. I think there were a hundred of them. Mm -hmm. there, there were booths, you know, all kinds of organizations. Any this kind of medieval story. Uh, is this the media, any kind of organization you can think of is there hawking their wares with their little slideshow or their little thing to you know printed thing to hand out or the big thing to hand out. I have no idea how much meaningful attention anybody actually pays to these darn things, but they're but they're there lining every spare space inside the secured area. Then there are the side events. <coughs> the side events in this meeting took place virtually exclusively at another hotel. And so there was a shuttle that ran um, back and forth, but it was something of an effort. This, this booklet is just the side events. These are the, this is, these are the side events that took place. Anything you can think of um, the California Air Resources Board had a side event, for example. Um, and then, um, of course, there were various pep rallies. Probably the biggest pep rally of COP 13 was <coughs> Al Gore parachuted in 
um, direct from Oslo, where he had been to pick up the Nobel Peace Prize. And he gave, he gave a good speech. But um, he was basically preaching to the converted. I, mean, I doubt if there was anyone in the room who wasn't. John, the funny thing was, the room was literally, I was sitting outside one of these contact booths, and the room was literally 40 meters away. And I watched him on a telly. I watched him on the TV screen in the hallway rather than going into the hall of the, you know, it was, there was something more important happening mm. here in this Well, because, because you had to be, I mean, one of the things with the contact group, someone like Matthew has to be kind of accessible and available. I mean, you might sit for an hour, mm -hmm. but when somebody wants something, mm -hmm. what do you think of this language? Mm -hmm. you know, just a couple of other things to, uh, to say here. Um, um, basically about outcome. Um, so, okay, <coughs> what difference did it make? At one level, the, the official outcome was the Bali roadmap that Matthew mentioned, a three or four page document. Uh, it's a roadmap in the sense that the parties <coughs> theoretically or in principle uh, agreed that this should be a sort of guiding document to move us, to guide us from here to Copenhagen in December 2009, at which point uh, there might be a new protocol, the Copenhagen Protocol, let's say, on a new uh, climate regime. Um, and it is true that, um, that the last possible second, the US agreed to this document. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, very hard to know. You know there are a lot of people who are, have ended up saying, well, this is really quite significant. The US agreed to this document. Isn't that a really significant accomplishment of Bali? Uh, I personally, I don't know what you guys think, I'm personally very skeptical of that interpretation. Um, I don't think that it signifies any particular commitment on the part of the US. Uh, there was a lot of pressure. Not too many promises were made. Uh, it was, I think, the absolute minimum that could have been done without characterizing the conference as a failure. Right? Well, that's my take on it. On the other hand, uh, what else happened? Uh, there were other kinds of uh, outcomes. Just say these last couple of words before we open up to questions. You've heard us, for those who are in the class, uh, talk about the kind of mainstream interstate international society. And this meeting officially was a meeting of representatives of nation states and very much a, an event of international society. But on the other hand, the medieval affair aspect, there are lots of other things were going on. I'm going to talk a bit more tomorrow about networks and networking. There was a tr tremendous amount of networks and networking going on. And that might very well be one of the most sort of significant threads to look at if you were kind of uh, evaluating. And then also there's a certain amount of, um, of uh, chemistry that occurs in face-to-face -face meetings. And this is, this is the terrible dilemma of these meetings is that on the one hand, um, the ecological, the climate footprint of a meeting like this is you know horrendous to think about. But on the other hand, um, there are things that happen in face-to-face -face interactions. There's, there's the chemistry of interpersonal relationships, and sometimes that leads to uh, imaginative and creative ideas. People encounter each other who would never be likely to encounter each other otherwise. Not so much the official delegates from the uh, member countries because they do encounter each other in various places. But a lot of the other 10,000 or so people who might very well not encounter each other. I mean, I'm very likely not, would likely not encounter Rocky Anderson, who is the mayor of Salt Lake City, a really interesting character when it comes to climate change if it weren't for a setting like this. So I think if, I think you have to sort of assess the results on a kind of multi level basis, um, who knows what will be in the 
Copenhagen Protocol, if there is a Copenhagen Pro Protocol in 2009. But some of these other levels, I think, are quite significant. So let's stop there and, and throw this open to, uh, to questions. Another way to measure the success, uh, I wouldn't disagree with the character statement, but another way to measure it is what's happening in the other process now, the larger measures for the DA, uh, and how much do they refer to the roadmap? And it was quite often. So the, the developing country um, uh, commitment in the, in the roadmap is to uh, agree to measurable, reportable, verifiable emission reductions. You know, that's, that, that didn't get renegotiated. I mean, that's a, that's a step forward. I mean, it's, it's modest, but it's forward. And everybody knows that the developed world is going to be forced to make big cuts. Whatever the U.S. says, everybody knows they'll be making very serious cuts. And they know that the, what's going to be the glue between the North and the South is money, money, uh, and the money to buy technology and uh, compliance and maybe differential time scales for uh, mitigation uh, obligations. So, I mean, you, you see the you see it taking root, and it's uh, it's moving along. So I'm I'm I'm, not, I'm very optimistic we're going to get an agreement in in Copenhagen. It's going to be ugly along the way, but I'm sure we're going to get it because we don't have a choice. Okay. Um, Deidre, how do you want to do this? Do you want to have each mobile? I think they, they see it as legitimate, and uh, they know that these 17 countries have the major responsibility for the reductions and the major responsibility for negotiations. And they're going to have to do a lot of the negotiating in side deals and then bring it back to the full UN process. It will be large emitters. They'll continue. The next meeting is in Paris, uh, the, a workshop at the, the last day of April, and then the first two days of May. And uh, then the G8, where they've already had the Sherpas meeting, and the G8 is going to be Japan in June. That's going to be another critical negotiating forum with the eight major economies. So yeah, I, I think they considered what happened in Bali legitimate and a, a floor or platform to work from. They, they know it's, uh, you know it's pretty opaque, but they, they used it. You know, n nobody said, oh, we don't like that, and we've we got to rethink it. It was very legitimate. Um, so looking at the more detailed um, technical measures, you kind of said you know that they're now the other economies. Um, I'm just kind of wondering how <coughs> how does that actually play out, especially if we're talking about a potential economic embarrassment with you know maybe also be a, a larger scale kind of deal. Um, are there issues um, where these We negotiate trade agreements, you know, by focusing on different sectors, and then we bring them together in a single undertaking, so they're all balanced. But I think it would be something like that, where the the key seven or eight countries for each of these sectors get together and fashion a deal that then is brought that is then brought to large emitters and G8, for example, and then into the full UN. I mean, it's, uh, it's the only way you can get the right experts uh, and the right industry people and the right governments into a single room. I mean, the, the Hawaii meeting was uh, no bigger than this room, okay? And the number of people uh, around the table would be, you know, 20 and then some staff in the back. You know, I mean, you can actually negotiate with that size. And you can't do it with 11,000 people.
three. 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 Yeah, I wish it was 30. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know whether I'll be outing them or, or not here, uh, but uh, I mean the first one was Connaughton. I know him from before he went his time in the White House, and when I was starting the Montreal Protocol campaign, I went to him. Uh, we were both on a panel in Chicago on the rule of law or something, and I grabbed him afterwards and said, I've got a strategy for you to do many times Kyoto without, a, without having to ratify Kyoto in a treaty that you've always been a leader in and that won't cost you more than a couple of billion dollars. That's probably what the U.S. will have to put in. And he said, I'm interested. He gave it to a staff person, Dave Banks, and I've worked with both of them and their staff, another staff person, Elizabeth Latt, for the, um, the last 18 months. And, they, and I've given them a series of tests, you know, to see if they would come through just to make sure that they're uh, they're dealing in good faith because, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly vulnerable when I'm working with the Bush administration. <laughs> you know, it's like, all right, is this a setup? You know, how much are they going to try to use me? I mean, they wouldn't get much out of it. But um, they moved on. And then the other person is um, the U.S. ambassador to Europe, Boyden Gray, former White House uh, general counsel under Bush 1. So there's a Bush 1 coterie that, um, that actually, I think, would like to do something good on climate. And, and I'm looking for the fourth one. But don't use these names, please. I mean, I don't, you know. Except, except Connaughton, that's fine. He can take it. Bali, we would agree some kind of a global target for greenhouse gas emissions. And there are, there are a lot of proposals on the table for the, the kind of cuts we need to make globally by 2030 or 2050. Different countries had different suggestions. And so there was sort of that level of ambition by some countries going in. And there was text in the document as it was being negotiated that reflected that. It referred back to the IPCC report that Oren mentioned. But gradually that was sort of whittled back and removed and so forth. And a number of countries, including the U.S., said, look, this is something for us to negotiate. This is part of the outcome. It's not part of the beginning. And so, you know, in some senses that was a disappointment to, to people who were focused on that. Um, but, I, you know, I do agree that, the, that what we have here is a good framework for moving forward. And so the, the basic compromise in the end was that all countries have agreed to adopt these measurable, reportable, verifiable national actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The language for developed countries has additional language on quantified obligations. Um, but the, the, the language is carefully framed so that the U.S. It doesn't necessarily apply to the U.S. Right? So there's a window that the U.S. can move through, but they're not required to. And the U.S. got the language, the same language for developing countries, which was part of their quid pro quo. And so the, the, there's this very fine balance struck there. And so it does set up the negotiations quite well. And I think the, the next thing really is whether you know, we can get sufficient support from people within Congress, from the United States in particular, um, to move the negotiations forward. Because the, the U.S. has, you know, and I agree with, with Derwood, there are excellent people in every administration. But this administration's position on climate negotiations has not been good. And so you can, you can look at the webcast um, final plenary to see the response by some governments to, to the, the sort of the U.S. blocking of the, the process in the final moments. And, and there was a lot of criticism about that. So the challenge now is sort of building that consensus within the U.S. and focusing it on Copenhagen. Um, I, I think part of this reflects um, a sense that within the community we're not completely sure, there's not complete consensus as to how to go forward. Um, the kind of defining feature of the Kyoto Protocol in a way was this notion of targets and timetables. Um, and although there's a lot of discussion about 
the need to make much more dramatic uh, reductions. There's a fair amount of debate about whether the specific features of the targets and timetables approach <coughs> makes sense. There's also a lot of debate about various kinds of policy instruments. For example, uh, there's certainly nothing approaching consensus that uh, cap and trade is the only way to go in terms of um, crafting a, a post-Kyoto arrangement. And uh, of course, in general, whatever is in the Copenhagen Protocol, uh, the great bulk of the implementation will have to take place domestically within member countries. Um, then the domestic political and legal and economic systems of these countries are extremely varied. And so there's no way around the need to provide a kind of framework, a set of goals perhaps, and, and, and the, some notion of a timeline that nonetheless leaves plenty of scope for the individual countries to choose their own ways um, to go forward. And I think myself that one of the critical issues is really going to be uh, what we are willing to agree to on the financial mechanism. Most of you know that we have had, a, in many ways, I think, very encouraging experience on the financial mechanism with the multilateral fund created under the Montreal Protocol to deal with the ozone depletion. And there is, I think, a lot of thinking that, well, we need to replicate that. We need to do something along those lines. And of course, that's a good idea. But there's tremendous uh, difference in scale in terms of what a multilateral fund uh, would look like in the, in the, in the climate case. Um, but it's clear that any progress would require commitment to the notion of common but differentiated responsibilities and a effective uh, financial mechanism to make that uh, arrangement attractive to a whole variety of the so-called non-Annex <coughs> 1 countries, the countries which include China and India, by the way, which under the UNFCCC don't have specific uh, obligations to reduce in this way, uh, which would, in China is increasing its greenhouse gas emissions by over 10% per year at the present time. And in fact, uh, interesting thing to think about, uh, uh, if you look around the world, who is actually going to make the Kyoto um, commitments by the end of the first commitment period in 2012? Well, the only ones that have a prayer of making the reductions that they committed to uh, under the Kyoto Protocol are the European Union. And it's actually not even clear that the European Union will make it. The European Union had a big advantage to start with because of special circumstances uh, relating to Germany and the UK. Uh, those circumstances are stood them in very good stead for a while, but uh, the, the latest <coughs> hard numbers, 2004, um, are not altogether encouraging, even about the uh, EU case. And certainly, I mean, the Canadians won't come anywhere near their obligations. The Japanese won't, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, well, we need to get back. Uh, to we, we better think of other governance approaches than uh, just cap and trade. And I think what Jackie was saying, uh, the, the Montreal Protocol is another model. And if you, if you look at the multilateral fund, it works because the, the people who run it know the technology, and so they know the cost. Because they have, you know, they have 96 chemicals, 240 industry sectors, but it's still a small piece of the universe. And you need, if we to get the funding right and the technology right for climate, we need to do it by sector, uh, source, sink, and sector. So you do it by steel. You know what it costs. I mean, the US and Europe will never commit to a, a blank check for technology. Uh, 
they'll only do it when they know a bound that will cost them $10 billion for steel and uh, so much for aluminum and cement. And so you have to be able to get drilled down to the actual plant, the people who run them, the state-of-the-art technology, which for aluminum is in Tasmania. Who would have guessed? The way that I mean, I'm making somewhat um, pessimistic remarks before, but um, the somewhat more optimistic remark is that once we get serious about commitments to substantial cuts in greenhouse gas emissions, there's going to be a lot of money to be made in dealing with climate change. The money may not be made necessarily by the same firms that are making it now in our hydrocarbon intensive economy, but there'll be a lot of money to be made. And those who see that clearly and who have the entrepreneurial leadership to get a jump on it are, gonna, are going to make money. But it's a little harder, I think, than with uh, ozone depletion because um, DuPont was accounting for approximately 25% of the market at the time, 1987. And uh, the truth is that DuPont didn't actually have the substitute technology <laughs> ready at the time, as some people think they did. Nonetheless, DuPont had a very good reason to believe that they were going to be a really big player in whatever, whatever came next. I, I think that's not so obvious with, say, ExxonMobil. We're at the five. We're happy, I think, to take more questions. But I know that um, our, our actual class period is finished. So if some people have to, to go, that's fine. But if some of you like to stay and ask other questions or make other comments, we're happy to stay. I, didn't, I don't think there are any major surprises going in. I mean, th these guys may have some, some other thoughts. Um, you know, the, the most contentious piece really was the mitigation targets and what, how much would be said in this document, you know, whether they would agree to a, a global target or not, um, and then how you would frame it so that you have the window for the US to jump through at the right time. The EU gets their strong language from the developing countries have language that's acceptable both to them and to the US. Uh, what, did, what do you guys think? Were there other, other yeah, things? I, 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 I would. I mean, it's a, it's a battle with the US, basically. I mean, that's the contentious part. Uh, but you have to recognize that you know, there's a lot of sly game, gamesmanship going on where you know, the, the Europeans know that the US will only go so far. So they always know how to look good vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US. China and Japan and Canada can hide behind the U.S. because the U.S. is always going to be the bad guy, you know. But I don't think there was anything surprising. What was surprising is that it took two friggin' weeks to get a three-page agreement that is uh, that has a, a very open-ended goal to move forward. It took three, it took two solid weeks of uh, of drinking. A lot of tequila flowed over the bar. Um, just a couple of quick things. So, uh, the, my perception, the first is, and Aaron, you'll appreciate this, is there was a, a lot of discussion about forests yes. and yeah, right. where forests fit. I don't think there were any agreement, um, but but ideas about forests when it comes to uh, carbon sequestration. Um, turn around there. I guess what I would say, I mean, it doesn't show up in the three-page document because we're just not there yet. This is a, a roadmap rather than um, a destination 
Um, I guess what I would say is that as the realization sinks in that we're going to be talking about really major cuts, when you're talking about 60 to 80 percent reductions in emissions uh, over the um, next few decades, people start to think, well, um, how in the world are we going to make those kinds of cuts when you have a society like American society used to a pattern of consumption and a style of life from one end to the other that's hard to change? And when you have other societies like the Chinese and the Indians who understandably have aspirations to ramp up their style of life to something that uh, resembles more um, the American or Western European style. And so I think that when as you kind of reflect on that, uh, the realization uh, sinks in that um, there's no way to reach these targets without thinking really, really hard about first carbon sequestration and second carbon capture and storage. Uh, and I think that it doesn't show up in the documents. It's not, not what we were negotiating in, in Bali, but I would say in terms of the flavor, the atmosphere, the conversations that were going on, that these kinds of uh, realizations were um, very increasingly clear. Um, the one thing that I think we all, most of us, I would think, fear in a way, um, and it hasn't yet become a pervasive theme in the discussions, I didn't detect it in Bali, uh, is the whole issue of whether we, whether we go to nuclear and whether we go to geoengineering. Um, as the realization of the magnitude of the cuts needed sinks in, and as the policymakers realize the difficulty of persuading people to change their lifestyle significantly, uh, the only way forward is to think in terms of sequestration, carbon capture and storage, and quite possibly uh, nuclear and geoengineering. Uh, I'm among those who are pretty scared, really, about the implications and consequences of nuclear and geoengineering. So with all due respect to the Blair government in the UK and so on, I would I was glad that these that those things weren't pervasive at least in the people I talked to in Bali. It's a, it's a horse race, you know, between uh, on the one side the accelerating feedbacks of climate change, and which we're seeing uh, move faster and faster, the loss of the Arctic ice, Greenland, uh, West Antarctic, the oceans absorbing less CO2. You know, it's, the problem's moving fast. And then on the other side is the technology, including carbon capture and storage, uh, new energy sources, deep geothermal, uh, some, some low-tech strategies like forest, like biochar. If we replaced uh, slash and burn with biochar, which turns it into charcoal, buries it in the soil for long-term storage, we could cut emissions by 10% a year just by that low-tech strategy. So in between you know, these two horses racing down the, the street are, is the law and the, the governance that we design. So how can we design by sector, uh, I would suggest, a system that uh, pushes technology to the maximum extent possible so it will evolve, so carbon capture and storage comes down in price. You know, we're, we're close with that, and we have to perfect it. Um, deep geothermal, if we could get that, we would have unlimited energy. You know, how far away is that? And in the meantime, we do need to change some of our lifestyles, but why don't we all drive hybrids? And, and why aren't they all white so the albedo uh, works in our favor? You know, I mean, there are some things we can do. So it's, you know, I wake up one day and I see the, the technology side moving ahead, and I think I've got five years left to be a radical because we're going to solve the problem. And if you're not in on making the money, you're a putz. Okay? And then the other day I wake up and I think we're screwed. You know, the, uh, the accelerating feedbacks are just going too fast for us.
One last question for Evan, I think he's. Um, I guess I was that, that was a pretty good segue, Derwood, because I was wondering um, th to what extent were the developing nations um, engaged in this process, or, or how, how much more engaged were they than they were, you know, uh, during the during the negotiations of, of Kyoto, and to what extent was that driven by the opportunities of CDM and the, the financial potential financial gain of tech transfer and things like that, and and, and were to what extent was it driven by the fear of disproportionate impacts on um, impoverished nations? My sense is that you know, in, in the run-up to this meeting, they were incredibly disorganised. And so I know that the, the G77 met once in New York two weeks before the meeting to talk about their plan. I mean, can you imagine going into a meeting this important, having only met really once to, to discuss the issues? And they were still thinking about the elements of a possible roadmap and what kind of proposals they put on the table. So I think you know, historically they've not been involved at more than the diplomatic level in the foreign ministries. So you have a few people in each country who are very engaged in the process, basically saying, you do it in the north. We, we, we are holding on to common but differ differentiated responsibilities. It's not up to us. I think they realize now that they are, they are going to have to play ball. And so there's much more serious engagement, um, both in the negotiations and at the domestic level. China has a, you know, quite a detailed climate plan and a taking action at the national level. Um, I think some of it has been driven by the CDM and by the opportunity to make money and you know, the flow of, of sort of private capital and investment into, into Indonesia and other places. Actually less so Indonesia. China in particular has really um, scooped the CDM projects. Um, and so I think we'll see a, a much bigger engagement by developing countries at a much deeper level, and I think that's a great thing. I don't have anything to say with Bill, but let me just make one comment in passing. I, I do. I think that um, this is an issue uh, which, on which it's very hard for the G77 plus China to act as anything remotely like a block. Um, on the one hand, you have the SIDS, the small island developing states. On the other hand, you have the OPEC countries. Uh, on the third hand, you have kind of large developing countries, the Brazil, China, India, um, to some extent South Africa and Mexico, very different kind of situation. So um, uh, that's not to say that there's anything wrong with what Matthew said. I agree fully that they're going to be increasingly engaged, but I suspect it's going to be very hard for them to act block-like as a as the G77 has done in some things in the past, like the new international economic order of the 1970s, for example. Last word, Bill. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. The <laughs> the developing countries are beginning to realize they're going over the cliff too. Okay. And so China, India, Mexico, Indonesia. Uh, they're all moving ahead, and it's a question of how far can they go on their own and how much uh, can they negotiate for assistance to go much further. So that's, that's a, uh, one perspective on the developing countries. The CDM side deals, there was a lot of uh, pretty venal uh, <laughs> negotiation going on. A lot of small countries are saying, you know, Psst, you know, I can set you up with a CDM deal, you know, if you cut me in. And so that was, that was both uh, kind of obnoxious, but that's the way the market's supposed to work, you know? So people were hustling deals, and as long as they were legitimate and they would be complied with, you know, what the hell? We should, that's the part of the fair that actually makes sense.